Hi, my name is Micah Long, and I'm a critical care anesthesiologist. I'm going to be talking today about how to speed up your learning curves for intubation. This topic is near and dear to my heart. I direct a lot of the training for our critical care fellows who are non-anesthesiology trained in how to intubate safely in the critically ill. They may not get great intubation numbers or volume, and their medical knowledge and abilities to manage hemodynamics will far outstrip procedural ability. And so I try to come up with a way that I can help maximize their learning chances and opportunities and therefore keep their patients safe. We know from my prior talks that intubation in the urgent and emergent scenarios is very difficult. The physical space and time you work with is worse. The hospital beds are worse. The patients slide away from you and your equipment is farther away. They're technically more challenging and difficult and they're physiologically difficult. The patients are aspirating or agitated, they're hemodynamically unwell, and they are hypoxic or hypercarbic and may not tolerate any degree of apnea without severe difficulty. Intubation uh, in the urgent and emergent environment has a host of complications associated with it, including severe hypoxia, hypotension, or cardiovascular collapse and even arrest. I've previously talked about experience being a unique risk to the patient. Inexperienced people are not great for emergency procedures. It takes years to develop the sort of skill you need to intubate an intensive care unit patient successfully or to intubate a patient who's decompensating in front of you. This is of course related to technical volume and skill, but it's related to all of the non-technical skills you develop over years of training, the ability to run a room, to lead, to be confident, to know when to stop the procedure you're doing and to use a backup plan and to know how and uh, um, how to apply the backup plan successfully and when to call for help. In urgent and emergent airways, as shown here, these skills and evolving success in these uh, areas take not 10, 20 intubations, they take years of experience, hundreds of intubation um, um, exposures. We know that inexperienced people have more likelihood to have hypoxia. And we know that hypoxia is associated with bad things like cardiac collapse or even death and mortality. And therefore we're faced with the idea that inexperience can harm people. Makocha scores have validated this. We know that the Makocha score or difficult uh, airway assessment tool is associated with difficult airways. In other words, the higher your Makocha score is, the more likely it is that your airway will be difficult. And that study also showed on the right here that difficult airways were associated with bad patient outcomes. One important skill or uh, score on the Makocha score is non-anesthesiologists. If you're not an anesthesiologist, you're more likely to have difficulty. If you have difficulty, you're more likely to have complications that matter. This is crucial to know and be honest with yourself about. And once you're honest with yourself about it, you will want to speed up your learning curve. Now, a group of uh, researchers at Harvard University looked at this and studied surgeons learning how to do minimally invasive coronary artery bypass grafting. The research team wanted to establish learning curves for this procedure and asked the question, why do some teams learn faster than others? And what their group found was what I term now deliberate learning. And they found the groups that learned the fastest did it in a very deliberate way. They practiced early frequency. They canceled all their normal cases and scheduled only minimally invasive cases and a bunch of them early and back to back so that they got that early practice you need with a new skill. They ran a dry run of working through the core parts of the procedure without a patient in front of them before they applied it to a patient. 
They used a consistent team. They didn't allow vacations from their primary team or substitutions or learners. They had the same team as they figured things out. They pre-briefed before the procedure, debriefed after to figure out how they could do it better, and then they tracked their outcomes to see and evolve and change and improve over time. If we translate that to the intubation world, similar things can help us learn faster in our critically ill patients. Early frequency has been shown in ACLS training to matter uh, greatly. We know we lose our knowledge quickly, particularly procedural knowledge after we learn it. Procedural skills are lost really quickly. You need to establish a broad pyramid of skill before you move on. Now that can be done on patients as able, but it can also be done with simulation. The term coined by this, uh, by researchers for this, is the sim zone, and this involves both that early frequency and the dry run. Simulation, of course, being a dry run. It's not on a real patient. The sim zone is where risks are high. You don't throw a learner in to do a high-risk airway where they might die. These are high acuity situations, and there may not be many of them, so they're low opportunity. In these situations, you want to practice frequently early, and you want a dry run where you're not going to hurt somebody. That's the sim zone. What I find interesting about simulation is that low fidelity can be just as valuable as high fidelity. You don't need a real situation with actors and 20 people. There's a place for that, and it's useful. But you can do a whole lot of great, fantastic learning using a simple airway mannequin. My preferred teaching style for simulation is something called mastery learning. Mastery learning is the idea that we shouldn't be ending a class with some people and learners having A's, some with a B, some with a grade of C, and then a couple that might re-loop and take it again. Mastery learning says every learner that takes this class needs to be an expert at it by the end. And the approach to learning is repetitive and recurring until everybody achieves that goal. You start out and you say, is the person a master at the material yet? Not yet? Great. We'll teach them something. You may do didactics. You may do on-hand guided teaching. You may simply make them hit some reps on a mannequin. Then you practice those again and again. You teach, you learn, you guide, you practice, you test them again. You measure their skill. Are they a master yet? No? do it again. Everybody has a different learning speed and everybody has certain areas they may need an immense amount of practice with, say LMA placement or DL or VL or putting the endotracheal tube in. And others may struggle with something different like bag masking or how to manage the tongue in LMA placement. Each one of these things can be learned individually and practiced in this mastery approach. This strategy has been used at the University of Michigan and in their group they've shown that exposure to pediatric mock code simulation which used mastery learning was associated with improved survival for their patients. I support a consistent team and this is almost impossible to do with urgent and emergent airways. Instead what I say is you need at least two people who speak the language and who speak the same language, use the same checklist go through the same things. This helps the operator. You know that if you ask for something with shorthand or uh, um, colloquial terms that you'll not only get it but you'll get it quickly and it helps you be confident. You know a friend is there who can help you if it gets scary. It also helps the patient. You recognize complications faster and you're faster in your intubation because you have those little things done automatically and for you. Pre-briefing is different in an elective procedure as opposed to an emergency intubation. Nonetheless, I'm a huge believer in the pre-brief, but I call it an airway checklist. An airway checklist, 
I gave a talk on previously. It's not meant to be a comprehensive how-to guide. It's not supposed to be a comprehensive list of 30 tasks. It's meant to move under big categories, slowly moving to smaller and smaller categories where you may not even need to look at the farthest over column. My checklist is TP me. Team, do you have two people and the other people you need? Patient, position, pre-oxygenate. Patient, what's their airway look like and what's their physiology? They have a hard airway. Can they not open their mouth? Funny profile, not extend their neck. And what's their physiology? Are they going to be hypoxic immediately on induction or are they in heart failure and are going to be hypotensive on induction? Position before you go to sleep and pre-oxygenate with as much oxygen as you can for as long as you can. M is medications, which I group into category. Pre-med for safety, not for procedural sedation. Do you need a bolus or norepi infusion before you give induction? Then you induce with either propofol, atomidate, or ketamine. You paralyze with rocuronium, my strongly preferred agent, or succinylcholine. And then you need to plan and always know your rescue medications. It might be epinephrine, ephedrine, it may be a norepi infusion, or just a phenylephrine syringe. The other M is monitors. Make them loud, make them go frequent, and sometimes put that art line in before you go to sleep. And equipment, there's a lot of things with equipment, but I just think of it in order of use. You're gonna to need to bag mask the patient. So you need a trauma bag with a peep valve and oxygen supply. It needs to not be broken. You'll put an oral airway in, needs to be sized correctly. They're gonna vomit on that. You're gonna need suction. You might need two suctions. After you've cleaned them out with that suction, you'll try to DL. You won't see any view with a DL, so you'll grab that VL. You'll get a view, you'll try to put the tube in. You'll need that endotracheal tube and stylet, but it won't go in. So now you need to LMA. The LMA won't work. You'll have to decide between a bougie technique, a fiber optic approach, or a trach. Now I've completed my equipment uh, um, checklist and safety check, and I've also reviewed my difficult airway planning for that patient. Finally, debriefing and tracking outcomes is something we overlook drastically. And I think we do this because we tend to lack insight into what just happened in front of us. If we think about our insight into our debrief, you have to be honest with yourself. Did the patient get hypoxic because they have ARDS or because I was slow? Did the patient aspirate because they were not NPO and gurgling already? Or did they aspirate because I used too much force with my DL or I took three attempts between DL and VL and had my hand down there uh, on their tongue? To this end, you need to be very clear. What went well and what will you do again? And what can you do better even if it went well? I don't believe personally in a long emotional debrief where I talk about my feelings. I'm really straightforward. I think I did that okay, but next time I need to have a faster way to get to my first attempt with the tube. I'm gonna do that by uh, having somebody else hold the tube beside me. I think that went okay, but I tried to DL for way too long before I grabbed the VL. The next time I have a hard DL, I'm gonna immediately move to a Miller blade and then immediately move to a VL, and I can do that in 15 seconds. That patient had hypotension. I think I gave him too much propofol. Those insightful things rely on being honest with yourself and your weaknesses. The idea of debriefing brings about the idea that maybe we should have coaches watching us and saying, hey, you do this funny thing with your left hand, or hey, I noticed that you talk a lot instead of just doing, or you over talk people and you need to be quiet. Things like that are things that can be picked up by a non-anxious coach or uh, observer of your intubation that you may not be able to have insight towards as the person in the hot seat. Coaching, I think, is a crucial way to get better as a proceduralist. That's deliberate learning, and I think it can be applied drastically to speed up your learning curves early frequency and dry run, set up a series of airways in the operating room and go in there and get busy. Do as many as you can quickly under routine scenarios. Utilize simulation, use it over and over again so that you maintain those procedural skills. 
have at least two people there that speak the language of intubation. Use an airway checklist, and after you intubate, always ask how you could have done it better. Track your outcomes, ask and find out whether you are struggling more than other people with intubations, and maybe ask a more experienced colleague to watch and let you know how you can be better. There's of course evolution in these things. It's important to optimize our learning in intubation by training us better, having procedural CME, procedural exchange between say anesthesiologists and critical care physicians or emergency medicine physicians, or joint uh, collaborative models between groups. Tracking airway outcomes is fraught with difficulty and challenging, it needs to be improved with better definitions for which outcomes matter. We want to speed up our learning and make deliberate practice and other educational models standard. Joint models, better devices, and better airway strategies, of course, all will help our intubation success for our patients. That's my core talk on speeding up your intubation learning curve. It's particularly important if you're a critical care emergency physician who may not have the day-to-day -day recurrent intubation exposure that somebody in the operating room will have. It doesn't make you a bad intubator. It means you have to approach your intubations like a learner, honest with yourself, and wanting to continually get better and better over time. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you a safe next intubation. Have a good day.